Welcome to the virtual roundtable on Asian law series. Um, today we will be talking about COVID-19 and the intersection with climate change. Um, this is the third of our new online series that was launched by the Center for Asian Legal Studies. I'm the director of the center and the thinking behind this series was really to put Asia at the forefront of intellectual debate concerning law, policies, and so on. So for today's series, for today's session, we are very pleased to be partnering with the Asia Pacific Center for Environmental Law, of which uh, Jolene Lin, who is, one of, who is one of the speakers today, is director of. Um, we have several more of these roundtables planned, so I hope that you will sort of join us for the next few ones as well. But I wanted to thank everyone uh, for joining us, as well as to thank everyone on the panel who will be speaking. Um, in particular, also to uh, Dr. Joseph Chun, uh, who is moderating today's session. And he is a member of EPSEL, of the Asia Pacific Center for Environmental Law, an adjunct associate professor at NUS Law as well as co-author of Singapore's first, very first textbook on environmental law. And so um, he will be introducing the speakers and without further ado, let me sort of pass the time to him. Joseph? Thanks, Jacqueline. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Joseph Chun. Uh, thanks for the introduction, Jacqueline. Uh, in the last few decades, uh, uh, the world has been sleepwalking into a crisis. And uh, in recent months, we have woken up to a new crisis uh, in the midst of the ongoing one. Um, the impacts of the pandemic are devastating, but uh, without trivializing the, these impacts, they pale in comparison uh, when we look at the magnitude and duration of what we can expect in the coming decades uh, of intensifying climate change impacts. And that is perhaps one reason why quite a number of people have uh, likened the pandemic to a fire drill for the impacts of climate change. Now, the pandemic has in the short term diverted our attention uh, away from climate change, but what are its longer term impacts on our readiness for climate change? Today, we are very privileged to have with us a lineup of four uh, very excellent speakers. Uh, they are all climate change experts uh, in one aspect or other, uh, and they are going to participate in our roundtable on the topic COVID-19 and climate change in Asia, opportunity or red herring. So let me uh, warmly welcome and introduce our speakers. Uh, Ipshita Chaturvedi is a lawyer uh, from the Indian law firm CNC Advisors. She practices and researches in a wide range of subjects in the environmental law and policy field. She is currently also a visiting researcher at EPSEL. Linda Yanti Sulyaswanti is an associate professor at the Universitas Gajah Mada and a scholar in Indian, Indonesian and international environmental law. Uh, she's concurrently also a senior research fellow at EPSEL working on comparative climate change law and policy in ASEAN. Angel Shu is an assistant professor of environmental studies at Yale and US College and she's the founder and director of, of the data-driven Enviro Policy Lab. She's a contributing on, and lead author of IPCC uh, assessment report 6 and was the lead author of the 2018 UNEP Emissions Gap Report on Non-State Actor Contributions to Global Climate uh, Mitigation. And lastly, but not least, uh, you have Jolene Lin. She's an assistant associate professor at the NUS Law Faculty and director of EPSEL. Her research focus is on climate law with a particular interest in climate change uh, litigation. Uh, so uh, without... Uh, Taking up further time, I will now call on our first speaker, uh, Ipshita, to uh, speak for 10 minutes. Ipshita, the floor is yours. Thank you, Joseph, and um, good morning, everyone. Um, there's a fair amount of data that tells us what the biggest contributors to global warming are. Um, and I'm willfully using the word global warming here over climate change uh, because I want to look at emissions intensive sectors for my presentation in the next 10 minutes. Um, there are many studies that have been done by different organizations in different jurisdictions, and they often yield slightly different results 
Um, for example, uh, the work done by the uh, EPA in the US uh, and their projections per sector are slightly different from EU projections. Um, and then I'm talking about global projections. And somehow, when one were to, if one were to do a clean sweep on looking at um, sector-wise emissions, uh, we don't really find Asia as a collective. It's often South Asia or Southeast Asia, and even there, there are massive gaps um, in data. So often we have to defer to uh, certain jurisdictions and the bigger studies um, on, on the data that we receive that contribute to global warming. And now these bigger, the biggest culprits, however, we can say um, are uh, energy and electricity, agriculture, land use, um, deforestation, industry, construction, transport. And these are more or less accepted sectors that uh, that have contributed to global warming and continue to do so. Um, in these as well, certain sectors, however, tend to get more uh, importance than other sectors. For example, funds and programs under energy and energy transition uh, far outweigh uh, programs under land use and sustainable food systems, um, or even um, oceans and uh, oceans as carbon sinks. Um, so there is definitely a disparity in, in the attention each sector gets. Um, and, and then because of the global link, um, these sectors uh, have these disparities within Asia as well. Um, the way I see this topic, climate change and linkages of climate change and COVID-19, uh, in my head, there are two ways to address it. One is, um, is it that we need to look at climate change as seriously as we are looking at COVID-19? Because the impacts of um, climate change are far more um, intense than, and than COVID. And then it's not getting the attention that it deserves because COVID has sort of pushed it back. And, um, so like, are we looking at climate change or should we be looking at climate change as seriously as we are looking at, at the pandemic? And therefore the action also needs to be as serious. Um, and then the second aspect is, will COVID, um, is, is COVID uh, going to help or inhibit uh, the work already done um, in, in the field of climate change? Um, to answer this, I'm gonna rely a little bit upon a sector that I work in and I know decently about, uh, that's climate finance. Uh, in a country like India, one of the main, there are two or three main barriers, if you were to really break it down, that restrict uh, a clean, a low carbon economy. Uh, one is definitely finance. Um, who is going to set up those systems that help transition or even build sectors for that matter for a country like India where uh, energy access uh, is, is a real problem and we don't really have data on how much of India is truly electrified even. Um, so if we are to look at finance as, as, as a theme in itself, there are two or three ways uh, climate finance happens in India. One is the flow of money from developed countries into India via programs. So that could be a Horizon 2020 program or um, just a, a grant given under particular sectors. Um, so now a lot of climate change finance is really reliant on, on the funds that come from the West. Um, so a, a lot of the narrative gets determined in the West. So the sectors that they deem important then automatically get the kind of importance uh, in India. So um, that's one way money flows. Uh, then there's of course loan based systems through multilateral banks like the World Bank and ADB and IMF. That's another place that funds um, climate related um, uh, projects and infrastructure. Then of course, there is the consolidated fund, which is taxpayer money, which could possibly also fund uh, projects in India. However, um, issues like um, defense, healthcare, um, really, I mean, having uh, infrastructure, roads, building of waterways, those always would take precedence over purely conservation um, activities. So um, the consolidated fund can be, can be um, a, a place where this finance can be effectuated. However, truth be told with the, with the taxpayer base and the myriad problems within the system, uh, this is not the best source for money for um, 
projects for mitigation and adaptation programs. Um, then there is, of course, private actors as well and um, CSRs and um, environmental social responsibility and corporate social responsibility. And now uh, government in India is at least trying to bring environment, water and biodiversity within the purview of um, corporate social responsibility. But then again, there, there is, there's a plethora of issues there. There's, um, there's human rights and then there's environment. So um, it, it kind of becomes part of a, of a vast kitty of, of, of projects that require funding. Um, if we are to look at COVID from the, from, from the finance point of view, um, whether or not climate change projects in India continue would really depend on um, what kind of projects get funded under the big funding agencies. So that could be the German GIZ, that could be um, Horizon 2020, that could be um, AFD from France. And, and it really depends on what happens over there and how they view it. So far as taxpayer money is concerned, um, last budget we saw a major chunk being attributed to solar water pumps, which could have been a good way to ensure regular water, which was also environmentally friendly and reducing the carbon footprint. Um, however, I, I think that a chunk of money because of COVID is now going to be dedicated to healthcare because if not anything, COVID has really exposed um, the, uh, the abject failure of our healthcare systems, not only in India, but in many, many jurisdictions. And I, I think a lot of money intent policy has to be pumped towards fixing that problem. Um, and in that way, I feel um, that COVID might push back some of the money that comes into uh, the climate projects. Um, then in India, we also have a real problem of uh, policy. Um, there has been a lot of uh, brouhaha over the draft EIA legislations um, that were kind of solidified uh, very recently. Uh, um, and in that, a lot of red tapism was removed, which activists also, of course, are afraid that um, that's also going to be relaxing a lot of uh, environment measures and construction is going to happen very quickly. But often in a country like India, there's a massive catch-22 in there because uh, a lot of policy uh, actually prohibits a low-carbon economy. Like, for example, if one were to ply a solar boat on a river, then we have so many um, regulations that are, uh, uh, that are not very relevant right now for the development itself of the waterways. So it might allow dredging for some rivers, but perhaps the transport or, uh, in the river using solar could take the load off of land. So that's just an example of how there is um, often bad policy and unclear policy in light of unclear data that is funded by and comes from India. And, and that is a, a major barrier. So far as COVID is concerned, I'm not sure how much COVID is going to add or detract from these problems um, th that exist in, uh, in climate uh, mitigation projects. Um, there are other things that need to be studied as well, so far as finance is concerned, which is also the role of implementing agencies, administrative fees. Of course, um, there is corruption and red tapism. And again, I don't know how far COVID really adds or uh, detracts from, from these issues. They will, they will always remain. Um, um, so I, I guess I'm ambivalent. I, I don't think, I think what COVID is really doing is, is that it's gonna expose what countries were going to do any which way. It's an amplifier of intent. Um, so that's how I, I view climate change and COVID um, in, in light of carbon finance, uh, particularly uh, in the context of India. I, I think my, my time is up, so I'll, I'll stop. Thanks. Thanks, Ishwita. Thanks, Ishwita. Uh, I will now call our next speaker, Linda. Okay, hi, everybody. Uh, shout out to my students in Indonesia. Thank you for tuning in. <laughs> so sorry I'm not there, but you're not there also. We're all online. So, <clears throat> 
it's been quite an adjustment for everybody to do this uh, webinar and Zoom uh, lectures, etc. So thank you so much for having the time to listen to uh, our perspective on COVID-19 and climate change. So <clears throat> um, following the logic from Ipshita's uh, presentation, uh, my presentation is somehow a little bit different because I'm looking at the impacts of COVID-19 and climate change and looking at their similarities rather than dissimilarities. So people are thinking with this, you know, COVID, COVID, COVID all the time, and then everybody's forgetting it about climate change. It's pushing climate change into the second row. But, but um, so what I'm trying to highlight here is, you know, what are the similarities between COVID and climate change so that we, uh, we can still be connected to our concerns about climate change whilst we're thinking about COVID. Like narratively, they are pretty similar, right? Um, both transcend ideology in testing the basic competence of individual governments dealing with complex longer term risks, right? Uh, judgment, what kind of judgment, judgment should be made. Uh, some government, uh, they fell short in you know, facilitating. Some government uh, have already uh, prepared themselves, you know? Both COVID impacts and climate change impacts are uh, involved in short-term investments, uh, longer-term problem of pay me now with a smaller amount or versus pay me later with a bigger amount of investment, right? Uh, the early investment in pandemic control and prevention in COVID-19 is uh, maybe the difference like similarities between uh, mitigation versus adaptation in climate change. So both present different choices for economists uh, because limited resources force difficult calculations. So, you know, I'm just trying to like looking at it on, from a different perspective, yeah? And then uh, this COVID-19 has brought us changes, right? Uh, Arden Roll in his recent research says that there are many changes. The first one is changes of behavior. We stop traveling, we don't go to commuting to offices, less transportation, good for the environment, but we also use more plastic, we use masks, gloves, everything, more chemicals, which is bad for the environment. So uh, they don't really cancel out uh, because we will go to the office again, we will go traveling again, we will do transportation, whilst, you know, the <clears throat> the harm to the environment has been done. So we need to think about what we can do from there. And then there's also a change of demographic. Um, uh, governments in Indonesia will face less mortality rate in comparison to, you know, Japan, whose middle age, uh, whose, whose median age is 47. But the government of Indonesia will face longer term of possible unhappy youth because uh, you know poverty if this anti covid-19 uh, efforts are you know indefinite they're going continuously on and on and then um, there's also a change of values while everybody is going including myself we are going into survival mode we think we have to survive not getting sick. Let me wash my hands, waste water every five minutes <laughs> and use chemical uh, hand sanitizer and everything. Uh, you know, before COVID, we didn't have to do that, but now we do. And then there's also a change of resources, like uh, including those who, you know, which we usually spend on environmental safety, environmental friendly stuff. And now we use it for something else. So uh, both COVID impacts and climate change impacts might think like they fall down from the blue sky. But, but anyway, both would have very large economic uh, consequences, albeit, you know, uh, public health or environmental consideration. Okay, so... Um, According to the, the 1.5 degree IPCC special report, 
uh, if we continue our emission on the rate that we are doing right now in 2030 uh, in 2052 we will reach 1.5 degree so you know that that's science that's the science of it so 2030 it's not very long currently we're in 2020 so why am i saying this because uh, the narratives between the impacts of COVID-19 and the impacts in of climate change although they are similar but they are framed differently by the media by you know almost all stakeholders when it's COVID-19 it's like it's now it's urgent don't get sick if you get sick the elders will die and you know very dear consequences for climate change impacts on the other hand it would be you know they will come the impacts will come soon near future but never now right although when we really think about the science when it's already 2030, there's nothing we can do about it. If it's already reached 1.5, it will be very hard for us to do anything because all the rapid change will come. All the uh, 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 displacements, malaria, dengue, climate related uh, impacts will already be there. Okay, so the role of the media, the role of research centers, universities are important in order to convey, you know, truth messages you know based on research based on, based on science you know not you know like what we have now <clears throat> and secondly uh both climate change and covid 19 bring rapid change in indonesia for example people are protesting because of mosque closures because of malls closures <laughs> but really I think they are just scared of the rapid change. They don't like, you know, suddenly not being able to do things that they do, right? Well, when we talk about climate change impact, the rapid change will come and they will come, you know, in such, uh, you know, really speedily so that, you know, you cannot even avoid them. So both are linked to rapid change, but in a different way. Like COVID-19 will be temporary. You will be able to go to your places of worship. You will be able to go to school, go to the malls again, you know, with, you know, uh, uh, your masks and your gloves and safe distance. But when climate change already come, the rapid change will be unavoidable. And the third, uh similarities is the comparison on carbon tax and stranded assets specifically on fossil fuel when we look at COVID-19 we'll see that the oil prices are already plummeted down and uh, although we know it's temporary right uh, but on the other hand the when it's climate change uh impacts when people understood that you know we need to do something and then hopefully everybody would go to renewable energy and you know leave fossil fuels so uh for climate change impacts people tend to not you know paying too much attention for it because it's too hard to comprehend the framework is just too heavy right for COVID 19 they needed to do it because they don't want to get sick but the, the impacts of climate change is maybe 1,000 times greater than the impacts of COVID-19. We need to understand that and we need to take that, you know, into our daily life and see how can we progress from, you know, uh, not thinking about the environment and now, you know, gradually understanding that if we don't do better, it would be us or our children or our children children who are uh suffering the consequences thank you joseph i think my time is up all right thanks linda uh, and our third speaker uh is uh angel over to you angel Hey, thank you so much, Joseph, and thanks so much to both Jolene and Jacqueline for organizing this panel and inviting me to participate. And it's low carbon, so that's even better. 
Um, so as Joseph mentioned during the introduction, the lab that I direct is called the Data Driven Environmental Policy Lab. And our whole goal is to apply data driven approaches and develop new climate models to understand the effectiveness of policies to address climate change. And so for the last five years or so, much of my work has focused on the role of cities and subnational governments, as well as private actors in contributing to global climate mitigation. What can we tell about the effectiveness of their policies? Are they implementing them? Are they following through? Because this field of non-state and subnational climate action is largely voluntary. And so in thinking about what COVID-19 means to the work that I'm doing, I think there's a great fear that because the upcoming climate negotiations have been delayed now by a full year, so the COP26 negotiations, which are to take place in the UK, were supposed to be this November, have now been delayed by a full year. And this is important because this was really the deadline by which governments were supposed to enhance the ambition of their original Paris pledges that were put forth in 2015. And so I think with COVID, a lot of governments now are playing a wait and see game to try to see what other countries are doing and how COVID will actually affect their economies in real time in order to determine what climate action they want to put on the table and whether or not they're gonna increase the ambition of those policies. And I think that's incredibly worrisome because as Linda so eloquently mentioned, we don't have any time. The IPCC 1.5 special report says we have to have global emissions by 2030 and then we have to really decarbonize by 2050. And so we don't have that much of a time to really enhance the ambition. And there's a pretty significant gap about a median of 28 to 30 gigatons gap between where we're currently headed and what we need to reduce global emissions by in order to hit that 1.5 degree goal. So there's a very short window left. Um, okay, so that's the context for my comments today. And I did prepare a couple of slides because true to my group's namesake, I wanted to show some data that helps provide more of the context for um, what we're dealing with. So I'm just gonna share my screen and hopefully this works and I can get into presentation mode. So the good news is that there has been a lot of COVID and climate change related research in the last couple of months to understand what the impact of COVID-19 and largely the lockdowns when you have about 85% of global emissions um, that uh, are of people actually being under lockdown and what the impact of that is. And so this is some of the latest science that has just come out in the last couple of weeks to show what the impact is of COVID-19 and these lockdowns and quarantine measures here in Singapore, we have circuit breaker on global emissions. And so you're looking at this figure here and on the left in A, you see that emissions have had a steady trend of increasing about 1% per year over the last decade. In 2019, we actually had a flattening of emissions, which you can kind of see at the tail end of this figure. Um, and this red mark is quite surprising. So this is the drop that we've so far experienced in the first quarter of 2020 due to COVID-19. And you can see that a little bit more closely on the right-hand panel, where particularly between March and April, there was a huge drop in emissions that equated to about 17% daily drop in global CO2 emissions uh, since the lockdown started um, in earnest in about March. And so this is quite significant and it amounts to essentially bringing us back to global emissions levels in 2006. And so if we extrapolate out this trend and we continue to experience the same drop of emissions, so the scientists think that the continued emissions drop due to COVID is not gonna be as dramatic as a 17% probably when all is said and done and countries start to reopen their borders and resume um, their resume their um, activity. Sorry. So um, when all is said and done, most scientists think that the actual reduction in emissions will be somewhere between four and seven and a half percent. But if that trend were to continue for the rest of this decade, we would actually hit the 1.5 degree mark. So that just tells you the magnitude and the significance of the impact on global emissions due to COVID. So most people would think, actually, this is great. You know, Linda talked about we, we need to speak about COVID and climate change together in the same conversation. And so most people would say, actually, COVID is quite positive. But I think um, if we take a look at the sector by sector breakdown of impact on emissions, the picture is not as rosy. So hopefully you're seeing my second slide here. And these are the climate impacts by sector. And so for some sectors like aviation on the bottom right in pink and also surface transport, so that includes road transport, 
by rail or by cars, the, the impact is quite dramatic. And also um, in teal here on public buildings, so these are commercial office buildings because we've largely been working from home. So those have driven most of these trends here. And so it's quite significant. But I look at this data and I am also a little bit more troubled by the residential uh, figure here and then also the power sector. And so what we're actually not seeing as much is a significant drop in these two sectors. And this is because our energy systems and our power systems have not decarbonized. They're not decarbonizing during this period of COVID. And so what that suggests is when we go back to recovery, we're still gonna be combusting fossil fuels. We're still gonna be burning coal for power. And we have been during the COVID and lockdown periods. And so that points to the really difficult structural changes that are gonna to need to happen if we wanna sustain the emissions reductions that are needed in order to achieve the Paris Agreement goals of 1.5 degree containment uh, rise. So I think, I think that's, that's really where the hard work needs to come in. And so as countries start to think about how they're going to recover post COVID, we have to get them to start thinking about green recovery. And um, in the United States where I'm from, the framing of uh, addressing climate change through green New Deal approaches. So how can we uh, address economic growth in the context of resilient climate change infrastructure and also um, giving people uh, economic livelihood and jobs. And so all of these are really important conversations that we have to think about when countries start to reopen and start to design these packages to respond to the economic hits that everyone has experienced. And so this idea of retaliatory pollution uh, that could happen, so a rebound effect, for example, once governments start to reopen is very real. Just to give you an example, during the 2008-2009 financial crisis, emissions did drop, albeit not as significantly, not as substantially, about 1% only globally. But then immediately after, in the next year, emissions rose by 5% in 2010. So there's a fear that something similar will happen. And um, Linda spoke a lot about the impacts of climate change and what's happening right now. I just want to emphasize that climate change is not something that will happen that uh, could happen in the future, it's actually happening now. And so this is some of the latest research also coming out of the journal Nature Climate Change that shows all of the concurrent climate hazards that are happening right now during the COVID period. And so what, as researchers and as citizens, we need to also be thinking about how climate change is exacerbating or has the potential to exacerbate the COVID-19 response and vice versa. And so I think there's a lot of um, research that still needs to be done to really understand how the two are impacting each other. And even uh, myself, so when I, uh, I just had a baby, my second baby, and when I came off of maternity leave, I shared a tweet on uh, my Twitter account and said, you know, is anyone else having a, a challenge actually working on climate change related research in the midst of this pandemic? And I got a response from somebody who is based in Africa saying, actually, Angel, you shouldn't be focusing on your climate policy research, what non-state actors are doing. What we need to be focusing on is COVID and the inequalities that it has really opened up and laid bare. And I started to think, yes, that's a really important point to make, but how can we think about the two together? And so in my own research, I just want to share some of the data that we've been developing and some of the research that we've been working on to try to bring uh, these two strands of really important global issues together, climate change and COVID-19, and also inequality and environmental justice. So one of the projects that I've been developing over the last couple of years has been looking at how cities are meeting the challenge of Sustainable Development Goal 11 for inclusive and sustainable urban and sustainable development. And what we found with respect to climate change is that in the 165 cities that we have analyzed, through this index called the Urban Heat Island Inequality Index. Uh, so in red, these are the cities that are disproportionately burdening poor populations within their cities with greater heat stress, with greater urban heat island. And so um, cities, particularly in Europe, you see this cluster where we think about cities being better performers on climate change and environment. They actually are burdening and not thinking about how to actually design policies to address climate change that uh, benefit everybody equally. And so. I think this is, this is why in the post-COVID recovery, we need to be thinking about how do we address these equalities that have been even worsened through um, climate change. And I think I hear Joseph's um, buzzer. Yes, show. yes that's my buzzer. <laughs> okay. I will show, I will show, um, quickly, yeah, just this, this new study, this is research that's in review right now. But what we found is that in 97% of major US cities, 
um, where uh, U.S. cities are exposing people of color to almost a full degree Celsius higher of urban heat island than uh, non um, than than white populations, and we can see that actually even more um, starkly in actually my hometown of Greenville, South Carolina, on the left, where you can see the dark purple circles are where uh, there are higher proportions of black populations. Over 50% of residents living in these areas are black. And uh, on the right, um, you can see that the blue circles, the darker circles are those that uh, are people that live below the poverty line. And so you can see the overlay between the hotter areas in the city and um, greater proportion of black populations and also poorer populations. So I didn't get a chance to go into my last um, slides, which are focused on what we actually need to do in order to build this more resilient post-COVID recovery. And going back to Abshita's comments about the need for climate finance, that's exactly what's needed. Uh, if we want to be able to hit this 1.5 degree goal, we need to increase fossil, um, oh, sorry, we need to increase green investments by about 1.2% 1, 1 globally and decrease fossil fuel investments by about 0.5%. So I think what this says is that actually it's very achievable. We're not talking about huge drastic shifts, but necessary changes if we want to be able to usher in a more resilient post-COVID recovery. Um, I do have a slide that talks about some of the sector by sector efforts that need to happen, but I know I'm out of time so we can get more into these uh, during the Q&A. So thanks so much. Thank, thanks, Angel. Uh, maybe we have uh, someone asking some questions about that. It gives you a chance to share your final slides. Uh, so uh, thanks, Angel. And uh, our final speaker is uh, Jolene. Uh, Jolene, take it away. Thank you very much, Joseph. Um, so first of all, I'd like to thank everyone for taking the time to join us this morning. I'd like to uh, thank people who are joining us from India, from Indonesia, Hong Kong. Uh, it's a real pleasure and one of the silver linings, I think, of um, the pandemic has been for the, the fact that it's forced um, centers like um, Epsel, for example, and, and, and Kels uh, to um, explore how we could use webinars and it, it, it's low carbon, which is great, as, as, as Angel pointed out. And also the fact that we can reach uh, a far wider audience to share ideas and, and, and also hear your thoughts on the work that we are doing. Um, I also like to thank uh, Jacqueline for um, inviting the Asia Pacific Center for Environmental Law to collaborate on this um, um, virtual um, seminar. Um, it's a real pleasure to be able to um, do so. Um, so I, I will first, um, we, we, uh, before I, I, I um, share my slides, um, I think what I wanted to, to say is that um, the work that I'm presenting on is on the issue of strategic climate litigation. How strategic climate litigation is being affected by COVID-19 or um, what are some of the possible effects of the pandemic on future climate litigation. And uh, much of what I say um, um, is, is, is based on my research as well as my uh, work for the uh, Children's um, Investment Fund Foundation, uh, where I provide evaluation services, uh, evaluation work on um, strategic uh, litigation. Um, so let me just uh, call up my slides and uh, I'll turn on share slides and see if that works well. Um, share, and let me see if I can turn it. Um, okay, so let's, I love it. I'm starting right from the back. Okay, so um, so I, let me just begin with um, an outline of what I would like to say in the next couple of minutes, maybe eight minutes I have left. Um, what is strategic climate litigation? I'm going to give two examples um, of strategic climate litigation. Then I'm going to talk about climate litigation during the current pandemic and, and off with some possible effects of the COVID-19 pandemic on future litigation. So strategic climate litigation is really referring to how climate litigation uh, whether it's by court actions or by legal letters to regulators, has been a um, strategic tool to advance climate policy goals over the last three decades. Um, we have cases against governments. Actually, the vast majority of the, the uh, cases in strategic climate litigation are against governments, uh, both national governments as well as subnational governments, as well as corporate actors, particularly the major greenhouse gas emitting companies in the oil and gas industry. Um, Based on current counts, we have about 300, we have 375 cases globally, excluding the US, and about uh, more than 1,000 cases in the US. Um, 
these numbers actually are underreported. Uh, part of the reason for that is because these the, the databases um, that 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 report on climate litigation currently report on litigation that has been concluded or has been settled but not emerging or ongoing litigation. And as you know, litigation takes a very long time, so many of the cases are ongoing and not reported. So I want to give two examples of you know, very significant strategic climate litigation um, uh, cases that have, well, well, I could say high profile cases. The first is the case of Lahari uh, and Pakistan, which was decided in 2015, just before the um, negotiations concluded the Paris Agreement. The grounds that were raised by the plaintiff here. So Lahari is a farmer in Pakistan. He basically brought a public interest litigation lawsuit arguing that the state's failure to properly implement the National Climate Change Policy 2012 and the supporting framework offended fundamental rights to life, uh, including rights to the and as, as well as other rights, including the rights to the home and the right to property. The judge who decided on this case, uh, Judge Mansur Ali Shah, um, called climate change a defining issue of our time. He ruled that the governmental failure to address climate change offends fundamental rights, including the right to life, Article 9, which includes the right to a healthy and clean environment. So what happened was the, 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 the end result of this case was that the court uh, issued a mandate uh, requiring the um, government to form a um, multi-departmental, uh, multi-ministry climate change commission to actively implement the government policies that had already been passed, but not uh, government policies and laws that had already been passed, but had not been properly enforced or implemented. The commission uh, was uh, subjected to a continuing mandamus by the Supreme Court and therefore, the commission had to regularly report back to the Supreme Court on the progress of uh, implementing the government policies and laws in Pakistan relating to climate change. So the second case, the second high profile um, uh, strategic climate litigation lawsuit that I, I like to look at uh, is the case of Ahenda and the Netherlands. Um, this is probably the most well-known case, so I, I, I won't have to say too much about it. Um, the case theory uh, that was advanced by the plaintiff was that the state of the Netherlands was simply not doing enough to mitigate dangerous climate change. As such, the state was breaching its duty of care owed to the citizens to provide a habitable environment and to protect their right to life. The picture here that I've, I've chosen is the day where the decision uh, by the uh, lower court, the Hague District Court, was issued. Um, as you can see, it was uh, there was heavy media presence uh, and, and it was uh, widely reported. Now, obviously, once the case um, was won by, the, uh, by Ahenda, which is a, um, a public interest, um, or you could say a non-governmental organization that was set up specifically for the purpose of pursuing this class action lawsuit, um, uh, of course, it went on to appeal and we then have the Supreme Court's decision, which was issued um, December uh, last year, so December 2019. The Supreme Court's decision basically held that um, the uh, two articles of the European Convention of Human Rights require the Netherlands to do its part to prevent dangerous climate change, even if it is a global problem. And I, I emphasize this point because many countries, when um, uh, when, uh, when faced with these lawsuits, the, 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 the case theory of the, uh, of the, of the defendant uh, government would often be that whatever they do is simply a drop in the ocean because climate change is a global problem. And therefore, lawsuits that target a particular country are, are ineffective and whatever it requires the government to do, it's not going to make much of a difference. The court slammed down such a view, basically are, uh, 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 pronouncing that the state must do what is necessary to achieve scientifically advised targets. They relied heavily on the IPCC science to set a reasonable target, and I call it reasonable because the government itself had adopted this target uh, as one of their um, upper limits um, in, in their own policy documents. 
Um, and here I, I reproduce a section from the judgment, which I think is worth um, uh, uh, thinking about. It says that climate change is a global problem, does not release the state from obligations to take measures in line with its capacities. And um, also in conjunction with efforts of other states uh, to protect the citizens from the hazards of um, dangerous climate change. So I, I, the reason why this uh, case was such a high profile and important case was that it was the first time that a court had pronounced that it was the state's obligation to do something about climate change because it, it, it compromised, it, it, it infringed upon their citizens' rights and also was a breach of its duty of care to its people. Now, uh, moving forward to looking at climate litigation during the current pandemic. Now, as you can imagine, during the current pandemic, in most places, uh, courts were closed down. Many of the proceedings had to be moved online and uh, priority was given to um, you know, urgent cases, particularly criminal cases or commercial cases, particularly those related to COVID-19. Um, so many people would have expected that climate litigation would have taken a back seat. Um, uh, however, what we do have during this period was a, but what we'll call Asia's agenda. Basically, the case is called Kim uh, Yujing, Kim Yujing um, and uh, South Korea. It was filed on 12 March uh, 2020. Um, the plaintiffs here were 30 youth activists. Um, they filed a complaint in the Korean Constitutional Court alleging that the country's con uh, climate change law violated the youth's fundamental rights, including the right to live in a clean environment. Um, specifically, in terms of the, 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 the uh, case theory, uh, they argue that the target to reduce 536 million tons of greenhouse gases by 2030 in the Framework Act on Global Carbon and Green Growth, which is the Climate Change Act that governs South Korean climate policy, was deemed insufficient to keep global warming below two degrees Celsius. Now, the reason why I call this Asia's agenda is because this case was filed with the support and with the engagement of a transnational network of climate litigators and firms including the people behind the Ahenda's case. And you would see that there are many, um, um, the, the case theory is, is very similar to, to Ahenda's, um, and this was interesting to watch. Also, one thing that's notable about this case is also the fact that um, it's in line with a, a series, a trend of youth activists filing lawsuits against governments. Um, and this is part of a broader um, social movement um, that has been uh, inspired by Greta Thunberg and the uh, Fridays for Futures movement. Lead you, your time's up, so please wrap up. Okay, sure. Um, so possible effects of COVID-19. What we'll see is that uh, litigation would be fighting up against regulatory rollback. There has been um, announcements by various governments, including the American government, on the relaxing of rules for environmental uh, impact assessment, for example. And litigation would be trying to fight against such regulatory rollback. Um, there are currently great efforts to, uh, to be writing legal letters to governments to ensure that climate co uh, considerations are incorporated in economic recovery plans. Um, climate attorneys are also taking lessons from COVID-19 lawsuits. Um, so just, uh, just a, the one thing I would say is failure to protect, protect lawsuits. There have been a number of um, uh, elderly care centers, local governments, local communities that have filed these lawsuits against the U.S. government for the failure to protect them from the um, uh, uh, from COVID-19. And I think that that is, could be a very interesting um, parallel to pursue in many of the climate cases uh, that could follow. Um, finally, I think I'll just quickly say but one thing about how um, economic recovery programs launched by governments are including climate disclosure requirements. And these climate disclosure requirements are bear big implications because large greenhouse gas emitting companies are going to have to reveal their emissions data if they want to receive loans from these um, uh, economic recovery programs. And it's a valuable source of uh, em emissions data and also could be used in court as evidence during any particular lawsuit. 
Um, so with that, thank you so much, Joseph, for giving me an extra minute. Thank you. Okay, so um, thanks, Jolene. And now um, we are going to move on to the Q&A uh, uh, section. And I'm going to start putting the questions uh, from the participants to the speakers. Uh, the first question that has uh, got a lot of upvotes uh, is from Chi Yun. And uh, her question is about Singapore, but I, I think I'm going to just broaden the question to cover uh, your respective jurisdictions that you're familiar with. And the question is uh, um, whether a green and just recovery is what Singapore uh, or other jurisdictions need. And what is the role of civil society and academics to get politicians to make this commitment to a green and just recovery? Uh, and, and sort of as a related question, also by Chuyin, is uh, what are the immediate policies that need to be in place right now to, um, to uh, sort of make this recovery green and just? Uh, maybe we'll start with, the, um, with Jolene, because I know she's familiar with the Singapore jurisdiction, and then uh, with the other speakers from the other jurisdictions, uh, you can chip in as well. Jolene? Um, so that's a really interesting uh, question because we haven't seen that much mentioned of um, a green dimension to our economic recovery plans uh, in, in, in Singapore even. And I think that the, the, the current um, narrative has been that economic recovery is important, obviously, for the sake of um, the, the future of the country. And, um, and, and while it's been, it, it, there hasn't been that much um, interlinkages between um, addressing climate change, which has been top of the agenda for the past year, especially since uh, Prime Minister Lee Sien Lok spoke about it in his National Day rally. Um, so I would say that the, the role of, of academics, of civil society, or just citizens like us is to, is to try to, to engage um, our um, politicians um, that to, 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 to show that we actually care that there will be a, a dimension of green and just recovery uh, especially in light of the fact that we will be going into elections very soon. Um, in Indonesia, uh, the government now is uh, already enacting what we call a new normal policy. And like basically what they do is just restarting the economy back to what it was before. And um, <clears throat> I think there's, there's, there are some uh, considerations uh, and worries, I guess, like if we would want to go to where we were before, whether this would be a good choice for us. So Indonesia needs to be smart and in making these choices because we are an archipelago country with small islands. We have 17,000 islands. And in 2030, we will lose 150 islands. Uh, which is not much when you think about 17,000, but still, if you live in one of those islands, you know, you, you lost your uh, everything, your livelihood. So, um, and I think uh, developing countries uh, like Indonesia, uh, we need to make this COVID-19 as a, as a momentum that would bring us to a better place instead of, you know, a worse place. So if we can think about the impacts that we are facing right now is a preview of what we will face if we don't do better, you know. I think uh, the government and, you know, people who are not aware of, you know, the possibility of the danger of climate change that's already upon us would understand. So it's not like developing countries cannot make green choices. We can, because now the renewable energies are already, you know, affordable and, you know, people can do better, like use less plastic, don't use single use plastic and, you know, and et cetera. I think that's what we need to do as developing country. Thank you. Joseph, can I also add to this sure. conversation? Um, because I just think that Singapore can't not think about a just and green recovery post COVID. I mean, oil prices, for example, went negative for the first time 
during the COVID-19 crisis. And Singapore's economy is incredibly dependent on oil refining. And so I don't think that it's an option anymore for Singapore to go back to the status quo and to continue as business as usual before COVID. I just don't think it's an option anymore. It's such a blind spot if the government and leaders are not thinking about how to actually make that transition because the price of oil has already tanked. And I don't think we're gonna see a meaningful recovery of oil prices to when they were the highest. And so how do we actually shift the economy away from dependency on oil refining and fossil fuels to one that um, can focus on green sectors, renewable energy, for example, R&D for clean energy and for climate um, resiliency. I mean, I just think that that would be the smart strategy to start to be thinking about how we shift the economy and recover. I mean, this is what the World Economic Forum has said is the great reset. It's the ability for economies to take a step back and to say, you know what? We don't need to keep doing what we were doing that made us vulnerable to COVID-19, for example. And I think particularly in the United States at a state level, it's really exposing all of the inefficiencies, all of the problems with our piecemeal leadership, our lack of national leadership, for example, and the need for states to, to, to step up and to, and to take matters into their own hands. And so I'm just, um, I'm, I'm positive and I'm hopeful that that will happen. Yeah, but okay. Uh, if you look at the context of Singapore and, uh, the question uh, is how does civil society and how do politicians, how do uh, academics uh, uh, convince the general public to see the link between COVID-19 and uh, uh, um, climate change and then to make that push for the government to make that green and just recovery? Uh, because you can see it, I can see it, but the rest of the people, the voters uh, may not see it. And how, and how do we then make them see this? Angel, you have any? Yeah, I, absolutely. Well, um, I think that that's like really the million dollar question. And as Linda mentioned, during COVID-19, a lot of consumers were ordering more Grab and Deliveroo and food delivery. And so the increase of plastic and um, plastic consumption really increased. And so I think, um, I think you have to somehow frame the climate change and COVID issue into terms that citizens really care about in order to, uh, to, to inspire them to take action and to push leaders to take further action. And so at least in my own research, I use data. And that's why I try to show some of the visualizations from my own group, because uh, I think that's one way of making the invisible visible and showing to different citizens, okay, here are the discrepancies, here are the disparities, this is what's happening. And being able to use that data and information to then empower citizens to then go and push for change on the part of leaders. Um, but I think like connecting these issues like plastic consumption and say, hey, during COVID, look at the increase of plastic consumption. This is not sustainable. This is bad for the environment. It's bad for the oceans. And then uh, being able to say, hey, look, and also, did you notice that air quality actually improved during COVID? Look at what happens when people take individual responsibility on COVID-19 and, and look at the climate impacts that it has. And so I think that that way people can feel empowered and say, actually, look, when I stayed home during circuit breaker, that actually did make a difference. Because I think a lot of these issues like climate change, they feel very abstract to the to ordinary citizens. But I think being able to draw out these stories using data and information and storytelling to then make those linkages, hopefully, I mean, that's where I see like the my responsibility as an academic to not just do this very esoteric research that can then gets locked behind a paywall, but then to try to make it more digestible and understandable and available to the public. Okay, thanks, Angel. Uh, uh, the next question is for Jolene. Uh, a number of people have asked about uh, the potential for climate change uh, in Singapore. Uh, they want to know, uh, for example, uh, an English says, uh, could you share more, climate, more about climate change in Singapore, the potential, the risks, the likely effectiveness, and, and Lorraine wants to know uh, what a case against Singapore government, uh, could it be made uh, on the basis of violating rights to life and a clean environment, uh, et cetera. So do you have any uh, sort of comments about these questions and how, it, how climate litigation could uh, be adopted or applied in Singapore? Julie? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, so um, first I have to say that climate litigation is not the silver bullet. It is a part of, it is one um, tool in a toolbox to try to galvanize climate action. Um, it is an expensive process. It's not something to just be taken lightly. Um, people often forget or don't think about the amount of time and resources that are put, are put into um, developing a case and then bring it through the courts and then implementing a judgment if you can get a successful judgment. 
or a judgment, in my view, a successful judgment is one that compels the uh, defendant to address climate change effectively. So having said that, uh, litigation is therefore not something that is necessary every time you want a government to do something. Uh, that's something that I, I think it's important to bear in mind. Um, in a study that I did looking at the opportunities and barriers for climate litigation across um, Southeast Asia, um, I think that Singapore probably ranks on the lower end of the scale in terms of feasibility for litigation as well as the effectiveness. Uh, why do I say so? Um, the um, many of the case, um, many, many of many strategic litigation cases are rely on judicial review. For example, judicial review of uh, environmental impact assessments conducted for major infrastructure projects, um, or judicial review of um, uh, environmental legislation uh, that threatens to uh, roll back uh, efforts to address climate change. Um, the, the, this faces uh, significant uh, impediments uh, in Singapore because we don't have those hooks to mount a case. In other words, we don't have an Environmental Impact Assessment Act, so that doesn't that removes a very um, commonly used pathway for uh, launching uh, climate litigation. Uh, in terms of constitutional rights, uh, yes, there has been a there has been a trend towards. Uh, uh, launching rights-based cases. Uh, many of these rights-based case cases are, um, of course, rely on the right to a clean environment, which is a right that is specifically enshrined in many jurisdictions, uh, many constitutions, particularly in Latin America. Um, um, but um, it, the, the right to a clean environment is not enshrined in uh, many other constitutions, including Singapore's. Uh, and, and, and our uh, constitutional um, case law on the right to life does not include uh, or has, not, has been silent on the issue of whether the right to life includes the right to a clean environment, which makes it very ch challenging to mount a case on that, uh, on that basis. Um, so I hope that answers the question. Thanks. Have you seen any climate change uh, litigation? Uh, Shita, would you know? We don't have a specific law like uh, on climate change per se, but we've seen enough litigation on uh, on water right to light on, and so on. Yeah, yeah, on on separate things. But I think the major problem in India is not to get a, a well worded judgment. It's really the implementation of the judgment. And in terms of law enforcement and implementation, I think that's a major problem in India. So I'm always skeptical. Of, Sorry, like I'm a negative Nancy when it comes to judgments because you have the judgment, but then who's going to implement it? And at the end of the day, if you don't see the results on ground, what good was that long drawn expensive litigation? Mm. Okay. And what about Linda? Um, can you, do you have any uh, sort of experience of uh, climate litigation taking place in Indonesia? And, and uh, if not, then why do you not think that uh, climate change litigation may or may not work in Indonesia? Well, in Indonesia, we have had many cases on climate litigation. Uh, but the fact is, well, it's the same as India. We don't have certain laws on climate change. But um, so the defendants usually, uh, the applicants usually insert climate change as a concurring, as a concurring uh, rules that would include climate change as part of the case. So, um, well, everybody knows in Singapore that we have had a lot of forest fires and most of the cases in Indonesia in relation to climate change is uh, linked to forest fires in a way and also floods and also, you know, mostly natural uh, disasters. So, uh, there are some wins and there are some losers, but I think uh, most importantly is that uh, because in Indonesia, the judges have very high discretionary power. I think the judges in Indonesia need to be uh, somehow trained and uh, informed about climate change and climate change litigation and how this would roll out. Uh, because I think, uh, as science have already predicted and we have already lived in it, uh, there's going to be more and more litigation 
uh, in climate change, you know, whether it is in Indonesia or other countries in the world. Uh, what uh, Jolene is just saying is just the tip of the iceberg. Like with, with the time, you know, the closer we are to 2030, 2052, we will have more and more litigation because like this, uh, this is unavoidable, especially if we don't do anything. Okay, thanks, uh, Linda. I, I, there are quite a number of case, uh, questions about climate education. So here's another one. Uh, uh, the question is by uh, Song Ming, and uh, his, his question is whether there are litigation cases filed by plaintiffs to undermine uh, climate regulations and policies set up by the state. So it's the anti-regulatory uh, uh, kind of litigation. I, I think I've seen those in the US, but uh, maybe Jolene can sort of say something generally about those kind of cases. Uh, besides the US, are, are these sort of prevalent? You know? Sure. Um, so actually, uh, one of the things that I wanted to say was that when we talk about litigation, we are not just, I mean, a win in the court is, of course, what we call the most direct victory. But we are also interested in the indirect effects of litigation. So the fact that it keeps the issue on a public agenda, it is an opportunity to law litigation is nowadays with many of these strategic litigation. The um, team works closely with a social media team and a big communications team in order to make that information relevant to the public and to get people interested in why we are litigating. I think that's very important. It's a bit like what um, Angel was saying, like, you know, it's one thing to do all this research and keep it behind a plate paywall, but how do you make it relevant to the people? Um, so, for example, if you see many of the recent high profile cases, um, they are often um, supported not just by a few uh, philanthropists, but also by a massive uh, crowdfunding co campaign. So it allows people to say, I can contribute $2 to this, this, this lawsuit, and I am a plaintiff. I am part of this. Um, so I think that's important. Um, so to answer to that question, yes, we do see anti-regulatory lawsuits, anti-regulatory uh, litigation. The vast majority of work that is done on climate litigation is often on how climate litigation is used to advance climate policies, but it also can be used to undermine climate policies. Uh, we see this trend most clearly uh, in, in the US, particularly every time there is a change in presidency. So when the Trump administration came into power, uh, the Trump administration uh, uh, had taken extensive litigation to undermine many of the uh, pro-climate policies that have been introduced during the Obama administration. And we often see this swing whenever it's between the Democrats and the Republicans and one, one swings to the other. Uh, we do see anti-regulatory lawsuits also in Brazil. Uh, we have tracked uh, one or two uh, anti-regulatory lawsuits in Indonesia, um, but that those lawsuits are pending and not concluded. Um, I, yeah, I hope that that answers the question. Thank you. Okay, uh, what a long question here. I, I've been reading it a few times, so I'm still trying to process, but it's a question for Angel. Uh, the question is from Conrado Cornelius. Uh, it, the question is this, uh, uh, can a mit climate change mitigation policy be economically equal to all people? Uh, how do you, uh, um, can yeah. you see that question? Yeah. Wow, it, it's yeah, and I think that's a really great question. And I think, yeah, it, I think, Conrado, you're absolutely right. It's no, there's no way to make a climate change mitigation policy be economically equal to all classes of people. And I think, um, as Linda mentioned, there are going to be some people who will be lost out by these recovery plans. But I think the challenge is, is that a lot of these recovery packages are not taking in consideration the multiple ways in which they could impact different populations in different ways. And I think that's really the key. So I think about, um, for example, in China, after the 2008-2009 financial crisis, their way to economically recover was through infrastructure spending and building tons and tons of uh, roads and buildings and um, and that has climate implications. So not only did that result in an uptick in climate emissions, but also air pollution as well. And then that has a, a number of human health um, impacts as, on, on different populations. And um, I think what COVID has laid to bear, and this is what I tried to bring out in my presentation, is that um, pandemics and, and climate change impacts 
uh, make the, the vulner already vulnerable even more vulnerable. And so how can we design post-COVID pr processes and packages that, that take into consideration those differences? So in the US context, for example, where I'm from, I can think about um, the trends of renewables and, and, and the fact that they're now, uh, in many cases, much cheaper than fossil fuel based energy generation. So um, how can we, we think about uh, transitioning workers, for example, that were once employed by these fossil fuel based sectors into those that are cleaner. So um, that, that would be one strategy. Um, and then I can actually, uh, let's see, um, if I can share my screen again, look at some of these other policies that the climate action tracker has identified as being um, critical. So these are some, uh, for example, in the energy and electricity supply sector, uh, fiscal reform on fossil fuel subsidies or simply eliminating them and then uh, providing incentives for zero emissions vehicles, for example. So these are some of the kinds of things that can become cornerstones of a post COVID economic recovery that uh, would help to address some of the inequalities that um, result when you have uh, when, when you don't take into consideration the impacts. So I've got a question now for uh, uh, Linda. Asking about the fact that, uh, as we know, it's just a matter of time for Indonesia that the emission will increase more than before. So I don't think green recovery will suit us, he means Indonesia, well. Because I think most, most of the people here don't have enough awareness about climate change. And when the pandemic ends, they will just go out and produce mass amount of emission. What do you think is a better solution for us to uh, face these issues? So my answer is that green recovery is possible in Indonesia uh, and this. We just need to make smart choices in rebuilding our lives after COVID-19. As you've seen probably uh, Angel's last uh, slide, that she can compare, you know, smart choices. What should we do so that we are, you know, supporting the environment and not harming it? Uh, and as for awareness, I think it's for all of us to, who knows? I think Joseph and Jolene had a banter about it and had, had a discussion about it and that, you know, everybody who knows about the impact of climate change can, uh, uh, articulate it to people who do not know. Uh, sometimes it's like talking to a wall, but still, you know, we still need to try. And if, if, and if we give examples, you know, if we bring tumblers every day to class, for example, or, you know, ride a bike instead, instead of a motorbike, you know, so that is conveying messages that we want for uh, other people. Okay, thanks, Linda, uh, for sharing the question and answer. Uh, here's a, a question for, I think, uh, everyone. Uh, it's from Eugenie. Uh, the question is this. Now, looking at how governments have uh, uh, responded to COVID-19, uh, a lot of it is through uh, uh, sort of measures that severely uh, curtail civil liberties. And so uh, if we look at COVID-19 and see it as a possible fire drill for climate change, does this mean that uh, in order to address climate change, we are also going to have to do the same thing, uh, i.e. Se uh, severely curtail uh, uh, civil liabilities? And, and what are your views on, uh, on such a, uh, Eugenie calls, authoritarian environmentalism kind of model? Uh, yeah, I mean, obviously, it's, it's been really interesting. So I'm here in Singapore, my family is in the US, and I had a sister who was in the UK. And so when the COVID-19 crisis was unfolding in these different places, I got to really study the different government responses uh, quite uh, closely and, and just seeing how uh, restrictive the governments were. Sorry about that, my, my baby is not happy. <laughs> um, so yeah, I think um, in the US, the challenge is, is because it's a very litigious society that governments cannot really be very authoritarian in their responses and requiring face masks and social distancing. So for example, in the, in the US context, a lot of um, students 
when they'll be attending campus in the fall for classes at, at universities, they've been asked to sign a liability waiver to say, if I get COVID-19 in the dorms, then the university is not responsible. Because what happened in the last semester is that a lot of universities were actually getting sued by students saying that um, there was breach of contract of universities not delivering in-person classes. And so I think we're, we're seeing a lot of that and where these very restrictive measures that um, are able to, to be implemented in China or in Singapore, for example, uh, keeping people locked down and, and, and uh, ordering universities and higher education institutes and even my son's nursery, um, so the, my, all the kids have to social distance and wear masks. I think those, those types of policies clearly are not possible in the US. Um, and then I think also in my, in my work and thinking about um, the impacts on, on citizens, I, I think from a mental health perspective, and a social isolation and inclusion perspective, you can't keep people under lockdown. I mean, it's, it's just generally not good for society. And, and I think we, we definitely have seen that um, in many different instances of uh, the, the riots and, 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 um, and the social sh uh, outbursts that have happened in, in the US context. So yeah, I think that while uh, for the climate, as we can clearly see from the data that I've shown, it has been very positive for reducing emissions, but it's clearly not sustainable in the long term. So, um, thanks, thanks, Angel. Uh, do any of the other speakers have a view about uh, to what extent? Oh, yes, Linda. Yeah, to what extent do governments have to uh, employ authoritarian measures to get people to you know uh, do things they're not sort of uh, very uh, willing to voluntarily do mm -hmm. in them? Yeah. So I think uh, maybe Jolene can back me up after this, but I think public public health measures are not authoritarian. So when you, uh, when you ask people to stay home, it's not like, you know, and when you go out of your home, you're gonna get shot or something like that. But it's also part of human rights when you respect other people's right to be healthy. So uh, I think three things that, that human rights is very proud about is respect, protect, and fulfill. And, you know, during this pandemic, it's not a normal situation. So uh, if the government have to enforce public health, public health measures, logically, logically, it should be acceptable for the people. But sometimes people think, you know, hey, wh why? Why we cannot go outside? Why can't we have, you know, beers outside of 7-Eleven like we used to? But, you know, but it's not, uh, it's not advantageous advantageous for other people when you do that. So whether uh, the governments need to do the same thing for climate change, uh, I don't think, I don't think uh, we have to go that far if all the people have awareness. But sometimes it's, it's very hard to uh, reach awareness, especially if the governmental policy is not reflecting the things that they're saying. So when, when they say, okay, we're going to build a green city, green capital, but on the other hand, they also open a coal mine. So, you know, uh, like people can say, oh, okay, so you're not doing what you're saying. So you don't walk the walk. So I think uh, rather than uh, debating whether or not public health issues is more important than human rights, I think both of them, you know, are mingled together and we need to understand what's going on uh, during pandemic and, you know, in a different time where climate change impact is also uh, at force. Thank you. So it sounds like you're saying uh, people are more willing to accept the measures and not feel very uh, compelled to do things if they see consistent messaging rather than, well, on the one hand, you must turn off the lights, but on the other hand, hey, look, Jerome Island is still, you know, processing oil, you know, so people will feel, hey, you know, they, they feel uh, that extra sort of burden if they cannot accept or understand the rationale for a measure because there's all this mixed messaging. Uh, anyone else want to say no, something Can about? I just quickly jump in here? Just, just yeah. I am aware of the, the limits of time, so just very quickly. First yeah. of all, I think that one must not misunderstand the, the body of scholarship on, on, on authoritarian environmentalism. The, the, the body of scholarship is asking the question of whether authoritarian governments are better at addressing environmental concerns 
because they have the power to push through environmental policies without the checks and balances that are typically found in democratic systems. And it's a very contested area. Now, I think that it is a misnomer to characterize many of the public health measures that have been taken in response to COVID-19 as uh, infringement of civil liberties. And I think that there has been a real big problem in, 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 many, in some countries. And I, 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 I totally second what um, Linda was saying that many of the measures that were taken were about protecting the community and the protection of the community required people to undertake certain measures that would curtail their ability to go out, for example. But it was not a curtailment of the freedom of movement, which is far more serious than as a, as a matter of civil liberties. Um, and my, my next point is, I do not think that any issue is important enough to infringe upon people's liberties, the liberty to live in dignity and to fight for what they believe in. Thank you. Okay, uh, so uh, yeah, we have run out of time. I, I'm going to uh, uh, sort of finish off the discussion with one final question for everyone. Uh, so in one minute or less, uh, can you share whether uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has left you more or less uh, optimistic or pessimistic as the case may be, uh, that uh, as, a, as, a, as a society, as a world, we can eventually cap the increase in average global temperature to 2 degrees or even 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels and why. Uh, let's, uh, start, let's sort of take the reverse order from the uh, speech uh, earlier presentations. So we'll start with Jolene and then uh, Angel and Linda and Ishita. Okay, Jolene. Thanks, Joseph. I'll keep my short. I think you need to be an optimist to work in the field of climate change. I completely agree with Jolene. I mean, I'm optimistic because the fact that so many people did abide the circuit breaker measures and did stay at home and quarantine and it had this big impact on the climate, hopefully that will demonstrate to people that individuals can impact climate change and can make a difference. So I'm personally optimistic. Yeah, me too here. So I think everybody in the field of climate change will be optimistic because there's, you know, there's no other way. And I think now that we see what we can do within COVID time, uh, it's a preview of what climate change will take place. I think we can do better. So uh, even, even in places where we think people will not listen for COVID, they're afraid that they lose their lives, so they listen. So I think, I think it's a good sign that uh, if we give enough awareness for the people that they are in danger, they would go to this, you know, uh, survival mode and you know and and do better Ipshita? i feel like i should be saying optimistic because everyone else did <laughs> but i i'm i'm honestly not sure about people listening because i'm from india and people don't listen and even when the cases are on the rise people are still roaming around without masks and gathering together for birthday parties and i've also heard things like um, which is really sad because a lot of people lost their livelihoods the daily wage uh, workers for example and they said well if COVID doesn't kill us and unemployment will. So I, I just uh, see matters, it's a little bit more intrinsic. So I would go with, I'm ambivalent uh, with a touch of circumspect. Okay, okay, and uh, thank you, Chita. And okay, and with that, we've come to the end of the round table. Uh, I hope all of you found the discussion useful and entertaining. Uh, so it leads you to do two things. First, I want to thank uh, the speakers. Uh, for sharing the thoughts and answering the questions from the participants. Uh, I want to thank you, the participants. Uh, you've been a great audience and asked some brilliant questions. And, and last but not least, I want to uh, thank the uh, very reliable NUS Law Events team led by Fina Wong for working tirelessly behind the scenes to ensure the success of this event. Uh, I can see the other speakers all agree with me. Uh, uh, and so with that, uh, it's goodbye from me and uh, all the speakers. I hope uh, everyone enjoys uh, the rest of your day. Thank you.